We could uh, bring this meeting to order. Welcome everyone to the Planning and Strategic Initiatives Committee um, for our public input um, for Crosby Statutory Public Meeting. I um, want to quickly uh, again reiterate some apologies on some confusion on the agenda. I think uh, some had thought it was 2 o'clock, but on the, our agenda for members of the committee, it was written as 2.30, and we really hold ourselves to what's in our schedules, and that's one of the reasons for uh, delaying the meeting till 2.30. So again, it's uh, in our schedule, it was for 2.30, and that's how we're starting. So for all that came in early, expecting it to start sooner, our apologies, and uh, we'll get started now. So I'll uh, formally declare that uh, this is a formal public meeting to consider applications under the Planning Act if a person or public body that would otherwise have an ability to appeal a decision of the City of Kitchener to a local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kitchener before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. Um, again, uh, the, um, the effort of this, um, this public meeting uh, is to take feedback, um, and I, I think industry um, stakeholders, consultants um, were advised to take uh, part in, in this afternoon's meeting. Uh, that's not to say that it's not open to everyone. Um, all are welcome to come forward with their input uh, on the uh, comprehens uh, comprehensive review of our zoning bylaw. Uh, we will have staff do a, again, quick presentation uh, on this. Um, I'd like to reiterate similar comments I made uh, in the last meeting that this is a uh, formal meeting for us to take input from stakeholders, um, consultants, um, those uh, that have a particular issue with their property, with what's being proposed under this uh, uh, comprehensive review of our zoning bylaw. Um, it is an opportunity for us to listen. Uh, staff uh, will not be uh, prepared to answer specifically uh, on any issues raised. Uh, they would need time to go back and, uh, and will um, make sure that they do respond to uh, any any uh, concerns that are raised through this pub uh, public body, sorry, public meeting. Um, so again, this is an opportunity for us to listen, uh, for staff to take this feedback, to take note of that, and uh, through the process respond to um, whatever is said accordingly. Um, so we will not be uh, asking questions of staff, uh, but uh, we, it, we will allow uh, clarification questions of the delegation, and that's more specific to clarification of, of what is being presented or said. Uh, it is not an opportunity for us to debate the matter amongst ourselves or debate uh, um, with the delegation. Um, so I'll start it off with uh, staff presentation. Uh, Mr. Richard uh, kelly uh, if you want to do your presentation first. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, colleagues and members of the public. Today marks a significant milestone. Staff is tabling the final draft of the zoning bylaw for public review. To clarify, staff are not recommending that a decision on the zoning bylaw be made at this time. The purpose of this formal statutory public meeting is for the committee and staff to listen to submissions on the final draft zoning bylaw. This is the second of three sessions for the statutory public meeting. The first was held last Monday, April 30th. This is the second, and the third will be held this evening at 7 p.m. The notice for this statutory public meeting was advertised in the record on April 6th and in the Kitchener Post on April 19th. We sent an email to the Zoning Bylaw Review contact list on April 10th. This includes 990 property owners, stakeholders, and agencies. The final draft Zoning Bylaw and companion official plan amendment was posted on the project website on April 10th and the complete agenda package, including the staff report, was posted online on April 20th. This final draft zoning bylaw is the result of four and a half years of work involving staff from across the organization, as well as agencies, stakeholders, and the public. We'd like to take a moment to say thank you for everyone to their contributions to this significant body of work. This presentation will provide an overview of the process to date some highlights of the final draft zoning bylaw, and will outline the next steps for the project. Zoning bylaws are legal documents that control the use of land, where buildings can be located, the size and dimensions of lots, 
and parking requirements. The city's current zoning bylaw is over 30 years old and requires an update as a result of the city's new official plan, the region's official plan, and changes to provincial legisla legislation and policy. So the process to date, between March of 2015 and May of 2017, staff tabled a complete first draft zoning bylaw through a series of components, and each component introduced new sections of the bylaw. As each component was tabled, staff also undertook a significant public consultation process, which included a review of each and every comment that was received by us. During this time, and over the last three years, staff's focus was on preparing and releasing these new components of the bylaw and then responding to all the comments we received as part of the preparation of this final draft zoning bylaw. The consultation process, which we've gone through over the last several years, went significantly above and beyond the notification requirements of the provincial legislation. A detailed summary is available in the agenda package on page number 1-2. Some key highlights and key numbers from our consultation. We sent mailed notices to 3,410 individual property owners. These letters advised them of proposed changing, changes in zoning to their property and invited them to the open houses. We held nine open houses and a total of about 415 people attended our open houses. We also held 60 individual meetings with property owners and stakeholders and 13 additional meetings and presentations for advisory committees, the Downtown Kitchener B BIA, the Waterloo Region Home Builders Association Kitchener Liaison Committee, and the KW Association of Realtors. In total, we received 582 submissions, and within these submissions, this con there was approximately 1,450 individual comments. As mentioned, all comments received on the first draft related to the content in this final draft have been reviewed and considered in the preparation of the final draft. The following chart shows the key comments we've received by zone or topic. Primarily, comments centered around support for the reduction in parking space minimum requirements and the principle of parking maximums, shared parking, and bicycle parking. We also had support for the commercial zones and their range of permitted uses, support for the principle of density bonusing regulations, concerns, had some concerns with and questions surrounding the concept of legal non-conforming. There was support for the principle of the natural heritage conservation zone, but concern with the application of it to private property. There were also concerns raised around the purpose of the existing use floodplain zone and concerns with the proposed range of permitted uses within the employment zones. In addition to these comments, there were numerous site-specific concerns also raised to staff. The final draft before you uh, includes all zones except the residential zones, so this includes definitions and general regulations related to all the zones before you. The lands in gray, in dark gray on this map are those that we have zoned in this final draft and this includes about 3,280 properties. Some highlights of the content of the final draft. The final draft is progressive and forward thinking. It will enable Kitchener conti to continue to build great complete communities. Some specific highlights are that it provides for the integration of land uses within buildings and on lots, which will, which will result in a more efficient use of land, provides for places that are protected for skilled employment, provides for community-based infrastructure to be located within neighborhoods. This would include items such as schools, places of worship, and community hubs. Provides for neighborhood gathering spaces, such as parks and natural areas. It provides for the conservation of Kitchener's natural areas and places less emphasis on the car by reducing the requirement for parking and encouraging and requiring bicycle parking. The zoning bylaw provides Kitchener with the opportunity to continue to be leaders in city building. 
Some highlights of the downtown zoning proposed. There are four downtown zones in Crosby, and the final draft includes an update to downtown zoning that incentivizes development while ensuring that said development makes a positive contribution to the community as well. Each of the four zones ensure a pedestrian scale of development for buildings along King Street. The maximum density of most lots downtown is generally a building floor space that is three times greater than the lot area. Now in some areas in the downtown, the density can be increased beyond this three. In exchange for community benefits, ones we focused on include affordable housing, public amenity areas, a mixture of dwelling types and unit sizes, encouraging sustainable development, and active transportation. And the amount of additional density that lots can receive through the bonusing process varies across the downtown. While drafting a new zoning bylaw to conform to the city's official plan, staff is recommending some refinements to certain policies and land use designations in our official plan to better reflect the intent of the policies. The purpose of the companion official plan amendment is to incorporate certain amendments made to the text, to redesignate a number of properties to better reflect the intended future use of these lands, and the areas that we've redesignated are found on page 1-278 of the agenda package. And lastly, the official plan amendment updates bonusing implementation policies. Now, a companion official plan amendment is very commonplace for municipalities tabling new zoning bylaws. The City of Waterloo and Cambridge have also taken the same approach for their new zoning bylaw. In terms of next steps for the new zoning, upon Council's direction, in accordance with the recommendations in the staff report, staff will consider comments received at this statutory public meeting in the preparation of a final zoning bylaw and companion official plan amendment. The recommendation in the staff report is that oral and written submissions received at the statutory public meeting on the final draft zoning bylaw and an official plan amendment attached as Appendix A and Appendix B to report DSD-18-002 be considered in the preparation of the final zoning bylaw and, com and companion official plan amendment and further that following the statutory public meeting, staff brings forward a final zoning bylaw and companion official plan amendment for consideration of adoption by council in 2019. Now the, t the timing of a tabling of a final draft zoning bylaw for council's decision depends on a number of interrelated factors. The most important being the number and nature of the comments we receive at the statutory public meeting. Now it's expected that staff will need some time to work through these comments received. As mentioned, at this time, staff anticipates bringing forward a final zoning bylaw which would contain all the zones in the agenda package for a council decision by fall of 2019. Prior to that, staff will bring forward a final zoning bylaw and companion official plan amendment for the downtown, including bonusing regulations and parking regulations for council decision in winter of 2019. More imminently, in June of this year, staff are planning to bring forward an amendment to our current zoning bylaw number 85-1 to implement zoning recommendations from the Residential Intensification and Established Neighborhood Study, or RIENS, and this was approved by council in March of 2017. Since staff will not begin the process of zoning our residential neighborhoods until after this year, the, this amendment to Zoning Bylaw 85-1 will serve as a preliminary measure to begin implementations of the recommendations from the RIEN study. This concludes the staff presentation. We look forward to hearing the submissions made at the second session of the statutory public meeting, as well as those submitted between now and the last phase of the meeting this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly Roots. Uh, there are some questions, so I'll go to them first. Uh, Mayor Vermenevich. Oh. No problem. Councilor Fernandez. Thanks. The last couple of sentences you said related to the reins. Can you just repeat those again? Because I wasn't completely hearing what you said. I want to make sure that I understood it. Sure. Through the chair, 
In June of this year, we will be bringing forward an amendment to the 85-1 zoning bylaw, which will implement some recommendations from the REN study. Okay, so in advance of the full, complete Crosby, some of the, uh, and you said REINs, so I'll, <laughs> the residential intensification pro, uh, program and the study that we had done, we will be implementing those in June. We will be ratifying that and making sure that they now are um, part of every application. Is that my understanding? If you just want to keep your uh, mic on, Richard. Through the chair, it's our intent to bring forward a recommendation report that includes an amendment to the current zoning bylaw to implement specific recommendations that related to zoning from the residential intensification and established areas uh, neighborhood study that was approved by council last March. It's our intent to do that since we're aware that the final draft zoning bylaw that's uh, being tabled today at the statutory public meeting does not include any content on residential properties or any regulations, and it may take staff some time to continue to apply new residential zoning to the approximately 50,000 properties that are in the city. We felt it was important to act on certain recommendations from that study uh, in the short term, so we would be tabling a recommendation report for an amendment to the existing zoning bylaw for council's consideration um, as early as June. Um, and the decision would be up to council to make whether they would like to consider those modifications to the current zoning framework in advance of what we table in the final bylaw for a new zoning bylaw. Okay. I think that's, that's really important for um, uh, us to understand where that's going to take us because I, I think we're, you're doing this in advance of the full Crosby uh, bylaw coming forward because you see that, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're seeing that there are some um, factors and some recommendations from that study that should be implemented sooner. Is that correct? Through the chair, that was one of our considerations in tabling an amendment to the current zoning bylaw. Okay. Great. Okay. I look forward to seeing that. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, so we'll move on to our delegation portion of the meeting. Uh, first is Andrea Sinclair from MHBC Planning. Andrea, I see that you're here to speak on uh, a few different properties. Yes. Uh, did you just uh, want to speak as a whole or uh, speak specifically to each property separately? I'll be speaking to each property separately. Okay. And I do have a presentation that... So good afternoon, members of committee. My name is Andrea Sinclair. I'm a planner with MHPC Planning. I'm here on behalf of four separate property owners. Uh, the properties are 370 Highland Road West, uh, 259 to 275 uh, Gage Avenue, as well as 300 and 335 Gage Avenue, 322 to 324 Lawrence Avenue West, and 508 River Bend Drive. Um, I just ask that uh, I have a little bit of wiggle room on the five minutes since I am speaking to. No, I'll try to Oh, OK. I, I don't think I'll be 20, but I may be a little more than five. So I'll try to keep my comments as concise as possible. I'd like to thank, uh, start out by thanking staff for all their efforts and thoughtful responses through the Crosby process. Uh, overall, many of our concerns have been addressed and we've written several letters in support of the final draft zoning bylaw. Uh, these are just a few properties where we still have some remaining concerns. So the first uh, property that I'd like to speak to is 370 Highland Road West. It's shown in the image above on the screen. Um, this is a commercial mixed-use development that includes grocery, uh, restaurants, office uses, personal service, and some retail. Uh, this site has an existing permission of 13,500 square meters of max leasable space. However, in the final proposed zoning bylaw, this will be capped at 10,000 square meters. We'd like that site specific to be carried forward into the final draft. 
Uh, it's our understanding that the 10,000 square meter cap is supposed to implement the official plan in terms of retail commercial centers. So we'd ask um, if that does continue that the 10,000 relates specifically to retail and not all non-residential uses. Because um, otherwise you can have the circumstance where you have a property that exceeds 10,000 without actually having a lot of retail space. Um, the other concern with this property relates to the ecological restoration overlay. And I've just shown on the um, above map, the property is outlined in red and the proposed ecological restoration overlay is shown in yellow. And just a closer look at it. Uh, so what we're requesting is that given the overlay relates to already developed lands that have a building and uh, a part, part I'm sorry, a portion of the building is within the overlay as well as the access and some of the loading areas that this overlay be removed just within the portion that relates to these lands. So just the portion that's within the red boundary. The next property I'd like to speak to, or series of properties, are located along Gage Avenue. This is an area that uh, is surrounded with residential to the north, residential to the south, and a number of other sensitive uses such as churches. The properties currently include a number of uses that will no longer be permitted under the final draft zoning, including office. Um, it's our request that these uses be provided either on a site-specific basis or that through the companion official plan amendment, staff look to redesignating this area as something more conducive to the surrounding residential. In our opinion, something like Business Park makes more sense given the way this area has developed over time. Uh, a lot of the general industrial uses that would be permitted really aren't appropriate given the proximity to residential and some of the other surrounding uses. This just shows some of the uh, residential that's located in proximity to the lands as well as a large health office at the intersection of Belmont and Gage. Uh, as well, I'd like to point out that there is transit available very close to this area uh, with a transit stop just a few meters away from the properties. Uh, a somewhat similar circumstance is 322-324 Lawrence Avenue West. This is another area proposed to be designated industrial. It's always been under industrial designation, but over time it's really developed into more of um, sort of people serving uses. Uh, and if you see by the laser. So this is our client's property. It's a small dental office. You can see there's residential immediately to the west. There's a park to the north. All of this area at the top uh, right of the screen is residential. There's multiple residential development to the south. And within this area, there's a number of uses, including a hospice, um, other dental offices, chiropractor offices, other health clinics, um, cultural uses. And the majority of these uses will be rendered legal non-conforming as a result of the final draft zoning bylaw. Our uh, clients have recently submitted a site plan application to expand their dentist office. And our concern is that they will go through the site plan process only to become legal non-conforming at the end as a result of the proposed draft zoning bylaw. Uh, it's also worth noting that the residential properties immediately to the west on Victoria through the official plan could actually have a dental office as those are permitted within all residential designations. So you've got a house immediately abutting our property that can have a dentist office and an existing dentist office that wouldn't be permitted. Um, we'd also ask staff to consider again through the official plan uh, companion document that this entire area be considered as we don't think the general industrial really makes sense anymore as the way this area is developed. The properties are small and a lot of those industrial uses are not appropriate given how close we are to residential. But if uh, at a minimum we'd like at least the dentist office to be recognized going forward. And the only other one I'm going to briefly touch on is 508 River Bend Drive, only to say that the owner is planning on speaking tonight, but on the case that he's not able to get here, um, we are in support of the EMP zone that's been proposed and the site-specific provision permitting office, but there are some concerns about some of the general 
regulations and we will be submitting written correspondence related to those details but it's just on things like uh, indoor showers and indoor bicycle parking that those not be applied to existing buildings and only being applied to new buildings going forward their concern is that any minor modifications could result in expensive uh, retrofitting of existing buildings so again uh, the owner will be speaking to that in more detail tonight and we will make sure written correspondence goes in today so that's all my comments and I think I spoke pretty fast so if there's any questions I'm happy to answer them I see no questions, so thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Oh. Okay. No, there is now. Uh, Councilor Jetsky. Yeah, just for clarification for the rest of the committee, the property in Lawrence 322-324, if you uh, look at the uh, screen, uh, right on the left side is Victoria Street running up and down, and Lawrence runs uh, from the left to right. So it's really the second property, is the corner property on the uh, corner, and then the one with the star right there. That's the 322-24 that the um, dental office that you're referring to, correct? Yes, right where sort of the pointer okay. is. Just for the, because otherwise you showed the whole street and we want to show where. Yes, I, just, I didn't realize until now that the streets weren't labeled, so my apologies. And that is all. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Fernandez, go ahead. Just a, um, not a question of the delegation. Um, do we, if we have questions of staff, do you want them after all the delegations or in between? Uh, no, it would be it would be after. And as I said, uh, staff uh, would be at a disadvantage to have any response because the matters discussed are on specific property. They are taking feedback, and as was uh, I mentioned in the last meeting, um, again, members of committee can take opportunity to connect with staff individually on the specific items if they have more questions of clarification. It's a, it's a general question of clarification. If it's a general question of clarification, if you think it would serve well for the committee to ask it now, I'll allow you, or it can, you can ask at the end, so you tell me. Um, I'd like to ask it now because it relates to the, the possible future discussion as it, as it moves okay. forward. Because of generality of the question, I'll allow staff to see if they are able to answer that at this point. I just staff wanna, can just key, leave the mic on. In case I just want to understand, is, does legal non-conforming prohibit use as it stands now? Not quite sure I understand the question, but legal non-conforming status is rendered when a current permitted use in the existing zoning bylaw upon approval of a new zoning bylaw is no longer permitted. Um, so an example would be in an area where a current zone permits an office use in the current zoning bylaw and someone has established that use legally on a property and in the new zoning bylaw through the change in zoning an office use is no longer permitted, that use would be considered legal non-conforming. And, and that can continue on to, in perpetuity? Through the chair, legal non-conforming use can remain on the property for as long as the property owner wishes. The property can also change hands as long as that same use is maintained and is continuous. The use can also expand through permissions that are granted by the Committee of Adjustment. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, on to the next delegation, uh, Dave Aston. Dave, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, there are a number of letters that have been submitted. I don't intend to, uh, obviously, speak to all of those. Um, and I did take the half hour uh, uh, time change to uh, have some discussion with staff, so uh, that was very helpful. Uh, I just wanted to speak to uh, a couple of sites and, uh, and a general comment, and I'll start the general comment as it relates to a bit of the lining of questioning that Councillor Fernandez just asked on um, legal non-conforming and minor variances and transition. And uh, I believe that Mr. Britton also generally spoke to this at the uh, first meeting. But uh, one of the things that, that uh, will be important to understand is how uh, future applications, whether future zone changes or future minor variance applications, uh, will be considered and permitted after this bylaw is passed 
because of changes to the Planning Act and the two-year moratorium for applications. So that's something that um, you know, we need to further understand and, and understand how that will be uh, implemented. Um, also, just a general comment, uh, there was some discussion on the RENES and uh, potential for that to come forward in June under a separate study and separate um, consideration. And I'm taking it by the comments today that there'll be an opportunity as part of that process for future comment that it wasn't necessary that we would have to make comments in that regard today. But I think my understanding would be there'll be future opportunity staff are nodding, so that's great. Um, specifically, I wanted to reference uh, one of the letters that I submitted and that relates to Funshine Developments. So that's 526 Lancaster Street. And uh, there's a Tim Hortons on the corner uh, there. And there's a vacant piece in behind uh, where um, our client had worked with the city on a land exchange. And uh, through that process, there were, there were our client's lands and what we referred to as uh, the ditch lands, which were the city lands. Uh, so that's uh, all been through a process. Uh, the lands have been site plan approved. And uh, what we're seeing in the latest draft of the bylaws is that um, there is an employment use uh, or an employment zone applied to those lands, uh, which we are thankful for. Although the challenge is that that employment uh, zone that's proposed doesn't permit the office that has site plan approval. Uh, we think there's an easy way to address this. Uh, lands just next door to the site have a special provision. And uh, that was the discussion that uh, I was having with staff. So I think uh, there may be opportunity there uh, to resolve that comment. So uh, we'll continue follow up just as we will on all of the uh, comments that were submitted. Uh, also just wanted to uh, confirm our understanding that uh, applications that are in process will you know, continue to move forward. And then if decisions are made with regard to those applications by this council, uh, or I guess a future council potentially, that if there's site-specific provisions, those would then be incorporated into the new bylaw. And I just make reference to that uh, as it relates to uh, the Bright Up Block and the perimeter development lands that is currently within a process and want to make sure that uh, that, that is also something uh, that is considered as a final report comes forward to Council. So other than that, uh, we'll continue to work with staff on the detailed comments. And, uh, and you know, uh, we do appreciate all the effort that's gone into uh, the bylaw to date. And also the comments that staff have provided in response to the second draft of comments as those were helpful uh, clarifications and responses. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dave. I see no questions. Thank you. Next is uh, Brandon Pistier from uh, McLean Piester Limited for 3328 King Street East. Brandon, again, you have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors, mayor, and, and staff. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here today. I know that um, through our planners, we've already expressed uh, support for a, for a lot of the Crosby zone changes um, on our various properties. However, we do have uh, one concern with the property 3328 King Street East, uh, which, as you can see from the map here, is located at the corner of River Road and, and King Street East. Um, the property has an official plan designation of commercial. The current zoning is C6 arterial commercial. And the proposed Crosby uh, current uh, zone change will, will be commercial two or column two general commercial. Uh, the current use uh, of the upper level is an office and the lower level is a, an elementary Montessori school. One for a school in the lower level uh, opened in September 2017. It currently has five teachers and educational assistants uh, with 18 currently enrolled students plus another five students which have either been uh, enrolled this year and are no longer there or tutored at the school. 
It's got capacity for 34 full-time students in the current lower level of the building. Um, some nights it hosts ADHD support groups and it is a licensed private school uh, by the Ministry of Education. The, the number is up on the screen, the license number. Uh, the, the permitted use that the school currently fits into is C6 educational establishments. The impacts of Crosby or the, the proposed um, uh, zone change that's being tabled today. Um, on the left side of the screen here, you can see the current C6 zoning permits educational establishments, which is a which is a building or part thereof, which is used primarily for the purposes of teaching, academic instruction or training. It also permits daycare facilities. Uh, we are not a daycare facility, but just to note, it does permit that. The current zoning um, bylaw has no indication of schools mentioned anywhere in the entirety of the bylaw. Um, and therefore, at, at the moment, one forest school confirms in entirety with the zoning bylaw uh, under C6 as an educational establishment. Um, with, with the new Crosby zoning, COM2, uh, educational establishment has been removed um, from the bylaw. Uh, it still permits daycare facility on this property, but it no longer permits any kind of educational establishment. Now, on a broader level, Crosby kind of replaced educational establishments with elementary schools, secondary schools, post-secondary schools, adult education schools, and commercial schools. Um, but none of those, unfortunately, are included in the Commercial 2 um, zoning. So the impact of this is, uh, Councillor Fernandez, is, this is an example of the legal non-conforming. We currently comply with the zoning. This zone change will make us legal non-conforming. So we can continue to operate, uh, or the school can continue to operate, but we'll have problems uh, on expansion, won't, won't potentially be able to get building permits uh, if the school wants to grow. Uh, it could also put the school potentially at risk from losing its license by the Ministry of Education for not complying with the zoning. Um, there are 17 private schools currently licensed in Kitchener. You can see from the list here that, that 15 of the 17 are in compliance with the current zoning bylaw. Under Crosby, um, all of the schools, uh, well, there will, there will still be 15 schools that are in compliance, however, one Forest School is the only school that will be negatively affected. Um, it will be legal non-conforming, whereas every, every other private school currently licensed and currently conforming uh, will be um, zoned properly as, a, as one of the school uses that I, I previously mentioned. Um, so we're the only one kind of, One Forest School is the only one negatively impacted by this, and, and we think this is, this is unfair. Um, we would urge you to consider one of the, the following solutions, either add elementary school as a permitted use in, in the COM2 zoning, um, and that's the new term, educational or elementary school, or add the old educational establishment to those commercial zonings. Um, you, could either, you could also add a special provision to, to the property to allow elementary school use, uh, or keep, keep the property zoned as the existing C6. Um, that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. There are some questions. Brandon, uh, first is Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Chair Singh. Uh, so just a curiosity about mm -hmm. this school uh, being in the basement. How did it come to be uh, that uh, we have a school in the basement? You can see here from the photos at the bottom, it's not, it's not really a basement. It's a lower level. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of natural light. Um, there's, there's areas that have full length windows that aren't pictured here, um, but it's, it's more of a, a lower level. You can see, um, Okay. you can kind of see. Uh, yeah. So is this, um, uh, you're looking to see, I, I, I understand your request. <clears throat> I'm just trying to understand, do you think that this is an ideal location for, like is this an is this a, a ideal type of use for this? Building? It's permitted in the existing use. Um, school school premises are, 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 sorry, it's permitted in the existing zoning bylaw. So, so yes, I do. Um, school uses are, are typically tough to find. Uh, if you look at a lot of the private schools, um, the newer ones, they're actually in kind of old churches and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is a nicely renovated space. It's, it it's is, a it's beautiful. beautiful. It's a I'm beautiful not trying space. To um, I, I'm just asking about the fact that it's uh, in the lower level. Um, yeah. 
and uh, should your should this school choose to move to a different location, right. uh, the idea of having another school also in a lower level doesn't. I'm just trying to understand uh, what the uh, what what would be the uh, ideal use for this space. Is that I'm just at, so really just wanted to ask you about it being in the lower level. You've answered my question, so thank okay. you. Um, and then one one of the. Uh, you know, just to, to expand on that, one of the potential expansion plans, I mean, depending on, you know, the success of the school and how it goes, would, would be to move upstairs and occupy the the entire building. Um, but to do that, we'd, you know, have to apply for a change in use permit, which I'm not sure, but might be impacted by, by this Crosby and, and we wouldn't necessarily be able to expand upstairs. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Fernandez. Thanks for uh, bringing this to our attention. Uh, a couple of questions, because I know a lot of small independent schools started in basements of churches, <coughs> and sometimes in industrial areas. I think about St. Jude School and, mm -hmm. and where that's presently located. So I certainly understand um, the rationale and your worry. What prompted you to, to locate in this area? Was it the price? Was it the zoning? Was it the location in terms of, I imagine, most of your students are driven into the school? Right. So I'm here today representing both the property owner. You know, we own that property and that building and, and have for, for a really long time. Um, we were approached this this past, or last summer, um, by, a, by a Montessori school teacher who, who wanted to start her own school. She was already with one of the other private schools and, and um, had a, had a new vision of, of combining Montessori and, and forest schools so that the students actually spend some time um, over in Chicopee every day and, and they you know learn learn nature in nature and, and learn biology outside and, and that kind of thing get get outside exposure and she thought it was a perfect site for the school loved the way the the, the space looked and uh, we've had really good reception from you know parents and and uh, and so on okay. So that was, you, you answered my next question, which, which was um, outdoor spaces for children. So that's already been uh, identified and you, you have, uh, the school has resolved that. Um, if this, so your request is essentially to either remain in the current zoning so that if the school grows that you can, or to add uh, educational institution to that zone. I mean, ideally, just a special provision to to allow the school to expand on that site. Um, you know, however, staff or council wants to do that, that that would be our request. We just we don't want to be we don't want the school to be limited in the expansion opportunities. Um, you know, start we, they started in in September with five students. There's now 18 students that could, you know, likely grow to to, to 35 pretty quickly, and then and then if it goes beyond that. Um, don't necessarily want them to, to find a new new location and, and uh, if the property's there and everybody likes it, uh, I see no reason not to expand upstairs or, or potentially expand elsewhere on the site. Okay, I think you make some very valid points and, and the, co the concern that I see and I've heard in the past from independent schools that trying to find an affordable location um, is for a, a completely independent way of learning and educating our children is very challenging at times. So thank you for coming in and, and raising this with us. Thank you. Councilor Jetsky. Just following up on this chart, I'm just looking at your analysis of current zoning and proposed zoning. So the current zoning, you've got 17 schools there. Mm -hmm. They're not all in the same zone as you are. They're a variety of zones, correct? It's a mix between uh, Maybe half of them would be institutional zones. A few of them are C8. Uh, a couple of them are C2. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a mixture of other zones that they fit into correct. currently. And then the proposed ones, some of those zones may not even change at all. That's correct. Some of them and are not changing. Do. And some of them are not changing. Uh, some, of ch some of them are changing to uh, urban growth district or whatever that zone is. And some of them are changing to a mixed use. Um, we're the only ones that are changing to a, uh, yeah. Well, I guess we're the only ones that are changing to a to a calm, um, calm use. So you and that other uh, school, the fellowship, are sort of the ones that are 
really impacted, and you're just representing yourself for the for the time being. I'm sorry, we're the only. You're representing yourself, the one for us. We're the only ones who are actually impacted by this uh, negatively, right? One for us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no, that's, that's okay. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Brendan, that's all the questions. Okay, thanks, Thank everybody. you for presenting. Next is uh, Dan Curry for MH, MHBC Planning. <clears throat> Welcome, Dan. You have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak um, on what is, uh, you know, clearly a significant uh, piece of work and, and undertaking by staff. Um, like some of the others, we'll be submitting specific letters, and I want to speak in a more more general way, and specifically about the bonusing, the density bonusing provisions. Um, and I and I want to make three points. And the, the first is is that uh, really how pleased we are at the approach Kitchener is taking to your your density bonusing provisions. Um, they're clearly laid out in the bylaw. The types of facilities that are provided in return for bonusing are clearly laid out. The mechanism or the value that you get for those is also clear. So it's, it's clear, it's transparent, and it's equitable. Um, so I encourage you to continue that in the final draft. Uh, do have two, two concerns or two points or maybe two improvements. Um, and, the, and the first relates to the mechanism. Um, so in the first draft, the mechanism was very clear. Um, there were a number of benefits, and if you provided that benefit, um, for example, a grocery store, you got a defined increase in density, and it was measured in uh, the floor space ratio. All density and the zoning bylaws measured in floor space ratio. So downtown, in, in the urban growth centers, the maximum density is three times provide a grocery store, you get that additional one times coverage. And it's, it's clear, transparent, but it's equitable. It's the same for a large site as it is for a small site. The, in the new bylaw, that mechanism has changed. And so rather than, same thing, if you're providing a grocery store, the bonus value you get now in the second draft is um, based on an actual area, an area, and I think it's 4,000 square meters. So rather than a ratio, it's a defined area. And, and the difficulty with that, of course, it's unequal for large or small sites. That 4,000 extra square meters of, of density for a small site is a lot of space. For a large site, it's only a small portion. And so we'd ask uh, staff, committee, uh, and ultimately committee to, to reconsider that mechanism and uh, that the floor space ratio mechanism was much more equitable. The second point relates to timing. So the bylaw states that bonusing is not available for, for existing facilities. And, and that makes sense. You shouldn't be able to get a bonus value for a, a grocery store that was built 20 years ago. So the, the bylaw, the, the way that provision is worded now, that the effective date is the date that the bylaw comes into effect. What I'd ask is to consider that the date be when the official plan came into effect. And the reason for that is the new official plan is what put the, bon the density bonusing policies in place. So essentially the zoning bylaw is going to implement those official plan policies. <clears throat> and so that um, if, if the effective date was the official plan, it would be appropriate. And the reason I would say it's appropriate is mainly for the larger sites. So there are larger sites downtown that may be staged, and so they may be under construction now or, or, or through going through the development process, and it makes sense that they be able to take advantage of the bonusing policies from the date they were first implemented by council through the official plan. And again, that's to a certain extent um, um, being equitable as well. So in conclusion, um, I, I certainly don't want to miss the first point, which is that the bonusing provisions that are laid out in the bylaw are some of the best. They're much better than many of the other municipalities that we do work in. Um, 
ask you to to maintain <laughs> the general structure, but I would ask you to consider re uh, going back to the previous mechanism of how the floor space is calculated and that bonus uh, is provided, as well as the um, effectiveness time, the effective date. And with that, I'd uh, conclude my comments. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dan. There is a question, Councillor Zinetsky. Uh, thanks for coming in, Dan. Um, I went through the package of uh, written material here from McNaughton Hermson, and I couldn't find yours in here. Are you submitting a letter as well to officially provide your your position? Yes. And where will that be coming? In the next day or so. I'm sorry. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll be I'll be completing that letter within the next day or so and submitting that through to staff. Okay, so I know you'll be sending it to staff because that's where it basically is directed. Do we get a copy of it so I can see where you're coming from? Certainly, we can make that available to you. Okay, thank you very much. That's all the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Vaughn Bender for Schlegel Urban Development. Vaughn, you have five minutes to make your presentation. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, we're actually speaking today on behalf of uh, a dozen or so properties, all owned by Schlegel uh, or affiliated companies. So if I could have your indulgence, we'll try and keep it as brief as possible. And we're not going into specifics on each parcel, but uh, we want to make a few more uh, general comments. And, um, and that's fine if you go past the five minute time. Okay. That's right. We're also providing uh, letters on behalf of these uh, dozen or so parcels. We have additional uh, lands that uh, we would be submitting comments on when the residential uh, zones come forward. We missed the time slot to get our presentation to you electronically, so you have a uh, slide deck on your desk, hopefully. So um, I'm hoping you can follow along, <clears throat> excuse me, as I make my comments, um, and I'll try and run through this fairly quickly. So I'm speaking on behalf of Schlegel Urban Developments. We're largely developing uh, commercial and mixed-use uh, residential properties in southwest Kitchener. Our uh, most long-standing commercial mixed-use project, uh, residential project, is the Williamsburg Town Centre. Hopefully you're familiar with that at Fisher-Holman and Huron Road, or sorry, Fisher-Holman and uh, Westmount Road, Max Becker Drive. Um, if you look at slide number two, you can see, you know, there are 15 different parcels there that all make up the Williamsburg Town Centre. And that's part of the complexity of, of, uh, of our interpretation of, of Crosby. So our lands are located on all four corners. Uh, if you move to slide three, uh, you can see that the town center is very much a work in progress. Uh, the blue indicates buildings that are built. The gray indicates buildings that are to be built. If you move to slide four, uh, just a, a general comment. i take a, a little bit of time to brag, I, I suppose. Um, we have been the recipient of a number of urban design awards in 2007, 2011, 2013. You see those uh, projects on the next uh, several slides. So slide five is our Libro Financial Building, our Starbucks Building also uh, won an award of merit. Slide six, our building at 1187 Fisher Hallman Road, the corner of our main street, an urban design award for urban elements in 2011. Slide seven, our Good Life Fitness Building, an Urban Design Award of Excellence in 2013. Moving to slide eight, uh, Williamsburg Town Center is a master plan community. Uh, it, we believe it is a quality example of mixed use development or a complete community, if you will. You don't want to highlight some key challenges that Crosby has presently proposed and as we understand it, would have as an impact to the completion of the uh, Williamsburg Town Center. So moving to slide nine, uh, two of our properties are proposed to be zoned mix three, which is the most intensive mixed use zone in the draft bylaw. These are uh, civic addresses 325 Max Becker Drive, which is south of Max Becker, where we have retail on the main floor and our own RBJ Schlegel offices on the second floor. And then the other is the main street portion of 1187 Fisher Hallman Road, where we have the uh, Williamsburg Arms and above that the uh, city of Kitchener a Williamsburg Community Centre in a pilot project location, our home, health, home hardware buildings and so on. And you can see how that's kind of carved out of the middle of our uh, sort of total project. Um, just 
talk a little bit about window and door openings. The draft zoning bylaw would require 70% window and door openings. I'm sorry if you can move to slide 10. 70% uh, window and door openings for street facing ground floor facades in the mixed three zone. We find this number to be challenging for several, uh, from several perspectives, including structural, architectural design, functionality, potentially for retail uses. And we, uh, we implore you to look at the detail of that regulation more closely. Uh, for example, this building, Building 600, as we call it on slide 10, has 28% window and door openings. So to put that in perspective, it should have 60%. We think, you know, it's kind of mimicked after Main Street Stratford, and uh, we think it's a good example of a, uh, of a mixed-use building. Our Good Life Building, slide 11, uh, has 47% glazing on the ground floor. And uh, you would think it's higher when you look at how closely those windows are spaced together, but keep in mind it's measured by how high the windows are or that, that section of brick that's above and the section of concrete that's below. I suggest it's quite you know, similar to the Bauer building or other historical uh, factory buildings, which we were trying to uh, replicate or mimic a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit. And um, again, it's, um, you know, a, a good representation, we feel, of a, of a mixed-use building. Um, if you take off the, uh, the west end of the building, you see this on slide 12, we have some graphics on the windows. Those windows are in front of the change room areas. Um, we think the graphics are tasteful. They don't overpower the building. But if you look at taking the graphics off, then our number drops down to 35%. Uh, moving to slide 13, one of our current projects at Fisher Holman and Huron Road, where the Tepperman store is, is, uh, is achieving 40%, uh, which is mandated by the Rosenberg secondary planning policies. So we did achieve it in that building. To me, when I glance at it, it looks to me like it's less windows than our Good Life building. In fact, but because of the height of them and how they're measured, it, it hits the 40%, but it obviously wouldn't hit 60%. Uh, slide 14, uh, building height. So the draft zoning that would be imposed through the mixed three zone would require a minimum height of 11 meters or 36 feet. Uh, our existing building 600 is generally about 9.5 meters uh, tall with a roof line of approximately 8 meters, uh, the tallest point being 9.5. Um, again, it, it would not meet the, the requirements of the mixed three. So the draft zoning would essentially mandate that all new buildings be three stories tall, whereas it may be more appropriate to encourage increased density, in our view, to encourage it rather than to legislate it. Um, if there were opportunities to build three stories and build four stories, and we had a market for those small uh, office users on third floors and fourth floors, uh, we'd be the first to be happy to do it. But uh, it is challenging leasing out second floor office space uh, in the non-core areas. Moving to slide 15, uh, I'd like to comment on parking. The proposed zoning generally reduces minimum parking requirements throughout the city. It also places an upper limit or cap on the parking to 130 percent of the required minimum parking. Under the draft zoning, our Sobeys Plaza could not have any more parking than it presently exists until we double the amount of floor space commercial floor space uh, currently on the site. So there's about 110,000 square feet built right now. We'd have to build another 110,000 square feet before we could add a single parking space. If you flip to slide 16, you can see uh, under the current uh, Crosby um, proposal, the area in red is what we would be allowed to build for parking to service all of the buildings that you see on that uh, on that slide, and and I and I will say as well that retail is changing. Um, when I started with uh, our group uh, 14 years ago, uh, the requirement from the city for the retail type of parking was 3.5 spaces per thousand square feet of retail. Our retailers, grocery stores, and so on were looking for five spaces per thousand. In fact, that's in some of our leases. It's a requirement that we maintain that or our tenant, you know, can leave the site. Um, 
presently today, you know, we're, we're having uh, retailer discussions, grocery store discussions, and they're moving down from five spaces to, per thousand. Nowadays, they're down to 4.2, something like that. So it is moving the right way. There's less people driving. There's more people taking public transit. We're building more walkable communities. We're certainly trying to do our part. But the, the draft uh, before us here takes that number down to about 2.25. So, in my opinion, the pendulum swinging a little bit too far the other direction at this point in time, and the impact of that is we probably won't have a grocery store going at our corner at Fisher Holman and Huron Road, where we're trying to build that you know next mixed-use community because um, the retailers aren't there yet, and we assume they're not there because the customers aren't there yet. Uh, I know we want to encourage good behavior, but but can we force it or not? So. Um, Slide 17, the draft zoning requires 20% residential GFA on an entire site. It's applied retroactively to buildings built even before the new zoning, zoning bylaw went into place. So again, that, that issue of becoming legal non-conforming. Um, slide 18, uh, this is an example of uh, space we have left to build between our uh, two-story building where our office is located. We have main floor retail, second floor office at 325 Max Becker Drive. We have a McDonald's on the corner, if you're familiar with the site. Uh, the area in orange represents about 5,000 square feet that we can add on to that site. With Crosby here, we would have to add, you know, that <coughs> if we did 5,000 square feet of commercial, we would have to do 8,000 square feet of residential to go along with that, which means, you know, uh, two floors of residential above that 5,000 square foot footprint. I'm not sure that we could add any more parking parking lot's fairly full already. Um, you know, we could go underground, but it's pretty hard to do an underground parking garage under a 5,000 square foot footprint. The ramp would take up most of the space. You know, you might have several floors of underground parking, and it's just, the, the math doesn't work. The, uh, it's not feasible uh, in 2018. It may be feasible 2028, 2038, uh, but our point is we don't think we're there today. Slide 19 shows, um, you know, the residential areas of Williamsburg. So the orange uh, stars indicate uh, townhouse and four-story <clears throat> four um, apartment buildings that we're building. Uh, those uh, four-story buildings are under construction. The towns are built, nice built form, pulled up right next to the sidewalk. Um, the yellow stars indicate uh, zoning we have in place for 10-story residential. In fact, uh, our footprints work out to three 10-story buildings. In fact, we'd like to maybe go higher with those buildings because they were approved back in about 2002 or 2003. So if we could go higher with those, that'd be great. Our point is they don't really count in terms of meeting the mix three zone because they're not on those lands. If you go back to that previous slide, you know that was outlined in red. This residential doesn't count because it's not literally in the same building. So we think this is a good example of live and work in very close proximity. Uh, we think this works as well and uh, perhaps better than some other live work uh, designs that have been tried in developments from Celebration in Florida to Dewani projects in Mississauga, uh, Markham. Markham, thank you, to um, uh, you know the uh, the McKenzie Town Center in Calgary and so on. It's, it's been, you know, we've done a lot of site research. Um, Williamsburg is a project that Ron Schlegel started thinking about 25 years ago. He went in the car and on the plane with planners from the University of Waterloo and did research, you know, in the eastern uh, U.S. Uh, coast, out west Canada and so on, see what kind of the best new urbanism projects were. And we came up with a hybrid that we thought worked in Canada. We also listened to what we heard from those other projects where they said, you know, the residential above, above the uh, retail unit isn't necessarily working for us. It's working in the short term because the real estate office is moving in and the, the broker just rents out the space upstairs, but once the community is sold, they're sitting vacant. So, um, Slide 20, um, it's just a, a photo there of our uh, four-story buildings under, um, under construction uh, at, uh, at Williamsburg. So we don't really have a good concluding slide here, so I'm going to pull you back if I can to slide number four. 
We, we really do appreciate that updating the zoning bylaw is a very complex and significant undertaking. And uh, the objectives for great mixed use neighborhoods are certainly, we believe, shared between staff and ourselves and council. Uh, I think it's, a, it's really regarding the implementation and how do we get there and how do we get there over a uh, period of time. So we look forward to the opportunity to work with staff in more detail regarding the concerns we're mentioning here today. We're here today, I guess, given the kind of uh, tight timelines uh, from this uh, final draft that came out, I think, on April the 10th. Um, we've, we've had very good discussions so far with staff regarding the initiative to update the urban design guideline process, and we think some of these measures uh, might perhaps better belong in the urban design guideline document and or certainly the urban design guidelines should be you know consistent with Crosby um, as well so um, you know there's that moving part to this and then of course there's the official plan process as well so I'm going to conclude by thanking uh, Alex Vandersloos in uh, our office Matt Robson as well and the team at GSP for trying to take a look at all of this material on behalf of our various uh, parcels out in uh, southwest Kitchener and I'm going to turn it over to Glenn for a few minutes. Thanks, Vaughn. Um, Mr. Chair and members of committee, uh, just a few comments following up on, on Vaughn's analysis and, you know, highlighting some of the difficulties of, of taking, you know, the concepts, turning them into zoning regulations, and what does it really mean when you're in the field. And, you know, I think we've come to the conclusion here that the proposed mixed three zone that's uh, proposed for a good part of the Williamsburg area as drafted is just not the appropriate zone for this area and uh, especially for this type of, of it's a commercial based town center and yes it will be mixed and there'll be other activities here but it's not going to be as vertically mixed um, as contemplated by this zone basically and we got to remember the context here this this is certainly it's a newer community um, it's urbanizing, but that process takes time. And, and you just can't, you know, turn that on a dime, if you will. You know, as Vaughn said, the mixed-use policies, I think everybody's in general agreement, you know. Mixing of uses, good thing. Intensification, good thing. Less cars, less parking, all a good thing. But it's a transformative thing, and, and it takes some time to get there. So we've got to remember, too, that one of the policies says, uh, in the mixed use uh, category says to provide the opportunity for lands to evolve and intensify over time and it's going to take some time so I think the mixed three zone is just it's 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 basically too aggressive for this type of of, uh, of site it's really more oriented to an arterial corridor that's more residentially oriented as opposed to commercially oriented this is the zone that provides for 10-story mixed use buildings predominantly residential commercial office on the ground floor so um, you know if, if it was applied as Vaughn highlighted with each subsequent building you know we'd be in a situation where we're back for either committee of adjustment variance or a zoning bylaw amendment and then going through that whole process with each building so um, you know I don't think that serves anybody's purpose really well so um, uh, we need to you know I think step back and then look at some new options or new solutions for this site. Um, the OP provides for these community nodes to be either mixed use or it does also suggest commercial zoning and there is some commercial zoning in this area so we need to look at do we do a site-specific commercial zoning to recognize these existing activities and the form and, and and ensure that there's a proper urban form going forward, but something that's more akin to what Vaughn showed in those slides. Or another option might be to come up with a revised mixed use zone, something that's maybe a little less intensive and has a little more flexibility, not as prescriptive in terms of minimum three-story buildings, maybe it's minimum two-story buildings, those kind of things. Or maybe we look at changing that mixed use designation to commercial and and uh, in the accompanying OPA that's coming along and create uh, a better commercial zone for the area. And fourthly, as Yvonne indicated, um, it's, it's the role of the urban design guidelines and how do they relate to the new zoning bylaw. Some of the elements that are, are being 
uh, regulated in the new zoning bylaw, I think are a little too prescriptive. Things like the window openings and the spacing between windows and so on. And I think those are better left to urban design guidelines that state some objectives, state some direction, but allow you flexibility. And whether it's 50% or 46%, it'll depend on the context and the use and the design solution. So um, I think those are my general comments. Um, you know, this final draft has come out very recently and we're now just starting to digest it and uh, we haven't had a chance to speak with staff yet, but uh, we certainly look forward to sitting down and hopefully coming up with a, a new approach for this site. And, and I'd suggest there's probably other sites in uh, some of the newer communities uh, around the city that maybe would benefit as well from looking at a new approach rather than creating a situation where we'd have, you know, extensive legal non-conforming activities. So those are our comments and uh, any questions? Uh, there are, there's a question, uh, Councillor Janetsky. Well, Mr. Bender, the last page you told us to look at was page four. And in the middle of that uh, photograph is the uh, uh, a building right in the center, right by the, uh, the roundabout. And it's noted as uh, two stories. The second level, are they residential or is that commercial? The, the second out? level is office. The main floor is retail. Okay, so it's all office on the, on the upper Well, level. office, I mean, there's the community centers located on that second floor as well. Okay, no residential. No residential. Okay. Uh, going to drawing... Um, No, I'm trying to find it here. The one that had you with the, maybe I gotta go back a bit. The, the uh, 12 properties. Oh, that's probably the first, page two. Yes, page two. Yeah. And you indicated when you were referring to the property next door to the McDonald's, and you were saying that if you had, there's room for expansion, and uh, if you do so much commercial, you have to do so much residential, and yet you're building two uh, apartment high rises there on the north side of your of your property in, where that wooded area is, and it it won't comply with, with the requirements that's required or proposed by the by staff. Correct? Yes, and if if I can maybe elaborate on that, uh, the point of what I was trying to make is um, you know we have the surrounding residential though as well, which is more uh, intensified. So, for example, although on the uh, specific parcel on page, sorry, I'll find it here, where the mixed three zone is to apply, we are not showing any residential. We were not planning any residential. We're supposed to hit 20%, but we're not. But if you look at our development as a whole, we're actually at, uh, you know, ultimately we'll be at 220,000 square feet of retail, is our hope, retail and office but we'll be at uh, 540,000 square feet of residential. And that you know, so I think we're meeting the intent, but we're not literally meeting it. And, on and, that's, and that's where I was coming with, the, with yeah. the line of questioning, because what you're doing, and, and that's not complying with the proposed regs, the way they're uh, put together. You mentioned so many square feet of residential. What does that convert to in, in units, more or less? I know okay. it varies from types of unit, but ballparking range. Well, I know in the apartment units, the 10-story apartment units, it's approximately 360 units. Our uh, four-story buildings are pro approximately 50 units each. So that's uh, 510, if I'm doing my math right. Uh, so I mean, okay. 600 un 550 residential units. Okay. So if we go back to that slide two, where you have the, the dozen properties, and you're saying when you opened up your presentation, you're saying you're representing the, the conglomerate of the, of the Schlegel, and I'm assuming each one's done for maybe tax purposes or whatever, or however you do it. But if this was all under one owner, not, tw not a dozen different numbered companies or whatever, but one owner, would you then comply with the regulations of putting that apartment building to in? To my in, in previous point, we would far exceed it, you know, because our residential is, is more than double our commercial ultimately as we as we complete the project so and and yes we separate parcels out on the basis of developing them sort of one by one and based mostly on financing reasons um, so that's kind of the the mechanical process of it 
So if it wasn't for separating those properties into individual uh, a dozen or so, you would comply then with the ultimate in terms of meeting the residential component to the uh, yeah. commercial? I believe we would imply, we would, uh, we would comply with the letter of it, and I think we would certainly comply with the spirit of it. I would think we're complying with the spirit of it right now. And I maybe will add as well, on our next town center development at Fisher Hallman in Huron, we are contemplating and we have the zoning in place, and that was developed with planning staff to be able to do our higher density right on the main street. So, I mean, our thinking and our planning has evolved, but, you know, we're kind of halfway through this one as well. So it's, it's a little difficult to envision, you know, what we've got is the gate posts and then, you know, halfway down the main street, we suddenly jut up and, uh, and then there's the disconnect with the parking and so on. So when I look at slide 19 now, you've got the uh, properties uh, uh, marked with uh, stars, uh, five orange and two yellow. I don't know what your timing is in terms of developing. These are the uh, two walk up, uh, four, five walk up type apartments and then two high rises basically, correct? Yep. The, the okay, start. so yep. if, how soon would those come on stream? Do you, do you see them? And if they go ahead of the, the, the commercial, then would you comply with the regs? So, so the two stars at the bottom that are side by side are the two townhouse blocks. Those are wrapping up construction right now. Landscaping is happening. People have started to move in. I believe that's uh, nine units in each building. Stand to be corrected on that. The three stars, uh, the next three orange stars are the four-story buildings. Uh, the, the bottom one is uh, occupied, built a number of years ago. The second one is under construction. The third one, the top orange star, is being sold right now. So it's uh, you know, hopefully going to start construction in, in 12 months. Uh, the apartment buildings is where we need to go next, and uh, we'd like to get going on design for that within the next uh, uh, 12 months, 18 months. Uh, th this has been a, uh, it would have been easier to build this as a big box site many, many years ago, or a couple of decades ago for the Schlegels, as opposed to doing it the way we're doing it. Um, 15 years ago, people didn't really buy into leasing a space on Main Street. They wanted to, to lease a space that fronted onto Fisher Hallman. It's taken a little while to get there, but I'd say now, you know, these types of mixed-use sites with the commercial and the residential in the same area, you know, it's, it's now becoming more popular here in Ontario, which is helping us out. We're getting a lot of compliments from the leasing world, and we're getting traction now that, you know, 14 years ago, it was hard to get somebody to come and look at a spot on Main Street, anybody who had, you know, a brand tenancy. So, so bottom line... If you build all these residentials that you propose, you feel you comply with the overall calculations, commercial, residential. If, if, the, if the zone kind of looked at all of our lands here as one site, yes, we would, I think okay. we would comply and we think we comply with the, the okay, objective. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of extra time because there were two speakers there and uh, you, they had spoken on a number of properties. Um, now, Glenn, you have, uh, you're registered for, uh, as well. Did you already speak and make comments? Okay, yes, that was part of it. Okay, thank you both. That's all the questions. In that case, uh, next is uh, Emily Elliott from HBC Planning, 46 Shirley Avenue. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Emily Elliott, and I'm a planner with MHPC Planning, and I'll be presenting today on behalf of the owners of 6 Shirley Avenue. 6 Shirley Avenue is located at the southeast corner of Shirley Avenue and the Conestoga Parkway and has an area of approximately 7.7 .7 hectares. It contains one building that's presently used as a warehouse for Broil King. The site was currently subject, or it was recently subject to a thorough analysis through the preparation of the city's official plan. And this analysis recognized the prominent location, visibility, and accessibility of the site given the realignment of Highway 7 that's presently underway, underway and it also acknowledged the existing zoning permissions. As a result of this analysis, the site was designated commercial, identified as being within an urban corridor, and site-specific policy area 27 was established. This site-specific policy area permits office uses up to 100% of the GFA to a maximum FSR 
of 0 0.5. And by our estimation, this would permit an office with an area of approximately 3,800 square meters. The current zoning of the subject lands is heavy industrial with a special use provision 196U, which permits office uses consistent with special uh, or specific policy area 27, as well as another or a number of additional non-residential uses. The final draft of the city's new zoning bylaw proposes to zone the subject land's general commercial zone. However, no site-specific regulations are proposed. So we generally support the proposed general commercial zoning, but in our view, the proposed zoning of the subject land should also recognize the findings and conclusions of the official plan review process, including the site-specific policy area and special use provisions of the existing uh, zoning bylaw. So the uses established through site-specific uh, policy area of the official plan have not been carried forward as site-specific provisions. So specifically, while office uses are permitted by the general commercial zone, they're subject to a GFA cap of 10,000 square meters, which is substantially less than uh, permitted by the official plan. And further, the general commercial regulations provide that the maximum uh, total non-residential GFA uh, for a multi-unit building or multi-unit development is 10,000 square meters. And again, this regulation doesn't recognize the office use permissions of the official plan. In addition, special use provision 196U of the enforced zoning permits a number of, non, of additional non-residential uses, including computer electronic and data processing businesses, research and development establishments, scientific or technological and communications establishments, and these uses are not prohibited by the official plan and, in our view, are considered to be appropriate for this location. So finally, while the subject lands, the subject lands are also presently used as a warehouse, and a warehouse is not permitted in the general commercial zone, so the proposed zoning would render the site, the existing use, legal non-conforming. To address our concerns, we request that the policies and regulations established for the subject lands uh, through the site-specific policy area and special use provisions of the zoning bylaw be carried forward into the uh, proposed zoning bylaw and that warehouse uses also be permitted. And I'd just like to acknowledge staff and thank them for their efforts uh, in the preparation of the draft zoning bylaw. We filed written submissions and would be happy to meet with you to discuss our concerns in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I see no questions. Okay. Great. Thanks. Is there anyone in the gallery that uh, hasn't registered but wishes to speak? Glenn? Mr. Chair, uh, I must apologize. I've been a little tardy. Um, I wanted to get a letter in by today on some of the downtown zones, and we've had some ongoing discussions about that, and uh, i just been swamped. Go ahead. But I'll do it this week. Um, I do want to, like my colleagues at uh, MHBC, um, <coughs> suggest that there's been an awful lot of work gone into this project, and there's some really good elements that have come out of this. We now have a, or will soon have, uh, a contemporary bylaw with uh, lots of modern standards, modern approaches, modern definitions. Um, you know, the uses, I think, are appropriate for today. The parking regulations have gone through a major overhaul, and that's been a really big thing and a really good thing. In terms of the downtown, uh, just a couple of comments, and again, I'll follow up in, uh, in some correspondence. Um, this is uh, my first comment is a comment you've probably heard from me before the last time we are here on the OP, or parts, I think it was, and that the densities uh, suggested for downtown, the base, if you will, that we're starting with is, is really too low for a major urban area like downtown Kitchener with all of its investment in transit and transportation facilities and so on. And I think we can start from a higher base. Um, and if you look at the development that the council has recently approved around downtown, the densities are quite high on a lot of these buildings and these buildings are being well accepted in the community. The bonusing system um, in, in the new draft is certainly improved over the earlier draft. But I do share uh, the comment that Dan Curry made about switching from um, an FSR bonus to an absolute bonus. And it really does make a difference, small site versus a large site, and, and what's appropriate in terms of the amount of bonus granted. So I'd suggest going back to the FSR approach. And then my final comment is with respect to some of the detailed regulations. And, and again, similar to 
you know, the comments that we made on the Williamsburg Town Center. Um, I think some of these detailed elements uh, are best left to a good set of urban design guidelines and uh, guidelines that I think staff can implement uh, with confidence. Uh, they don't need to go into um, uh, a zoning bylaw and then require, you know, subsequent zoning amendments or trips to the Committee of Adjustment for variances. So things like prescribing where a step back is and the amount of that step back, uh, the minimum ground floor facade uh, width as a percentage of the width to the street line, minimum percent of ground floor facade openings. It's established at 70% downtown. You saw from those photographs, you know, some very good looking buildings that had facade openings that were a lot less than 70%. And uh, those sorts of things. So I think, again, we can work with a good set of guidelines as probably a better way than trying to enshrine all those things into a zoning bylaw. So those are my comments. I'll certainly follow up with, uh, with a letter, uh, hopefully later this week. All right. And I'm under five minutes. <laughs> yes, you are. And Glenn, there are questions of you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Glenn, for your comments. Just uh, wonder on uh, what's your opinion about <clears throat> the that there are two developments that are uh, co coming that have been uh, that have not come before council because they they are allowed as of right with the FSR uh, that they have uh, 31 story 32 story and um, is do you feel like really they should have been allowed to be. Um, well, what's your opinion about the, the height? Do you, or do you feel like that's high enough? Well, uh, Kitcher's uh, approach uh, to, to uh, zoning really has, has not weighed in on building height. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think the key for any major urban area is to have good design. Yeah. That's first and foremost. Whether the building is 20 stories or 22 stories, at that height, it really doesn't matter. Give me a really good looking building. Good base, good middle, good top, activity at grade in a downtown area. Those are the key things. Okay, and have we addressed those things, uh, in your opinion, with this new uh, urban growth center zoning? Um, well, as I said, some of it's being too prescriptive. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so whether it's 70% glazing along the ground floor or 65%. You walking down the street, I don't think you'd be able to tell. It's more about, again, good design, lots of activity at grade. And, um, you know, not all designers are built the same, right? Or, uh, so uh, how can we ensure, and you're saying not to be too prescriptive, but you're also saying what I'm hearing is um, maybe contradictory uh, to, uh, in, uh, because I'm trying to understand how can we prescribe good design to the best of our ability? Well, uh, a good set of urban design guidelines communicates your desires and your directions, your objectives with respect to design. Uh, good staff people can work through that process and achieve results with the development application. Everything goes through a site plan application. If there's a dispute, then bring it back to council and let council make a decision. Another venue or another uh, means that some communities have used is a design review panel. So peers dealing with peers. Mm -hmm. And that's been quite successful in a lot of areas too. Okay, thank you. I value your opinion. That's why I'm, I'm not trying to um, yeah, no, you know, accuse it, you of being contradictory, but I really was trying to understand what, what, yeah. you know, yeah. where you're coming from. Okay, thanks. Councillor Davey. Thank you. My question, actually, Councillor Marsh pretty much uh, hit it right on because, you know, obviously we do have to sometimes uh, put these rules in place for the lowest common denominator, right? So, unfortunately, yep. the, the, the phenomenal builders like uh, the Schlegels, get, we want to get them caught up in that. Uh, so, I just wanted to clarify that then. So, um, obviously, there's issues with facade openings, and I, it's, it's certainly not lost on me. Uh, but if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, that you're not necessarily saying take those sort of regulations out completely, just perhaps lower those 
significantly to sort of capture those lowest common denominators, and then in the urban design guidelines, and say, you know, ideally we'd like that 70 percent, whatever it may be. Yeah, just using design guidelines just allows more flexibility, right? You know, that, in my opinion, there's no magic number. You know, is it 70 percent opening that's correct? Is it 75 percent? Is it 80 percent? Or can you do a really good building at 62 percent? You know. And, and, you know, as, as the example at Williamsburg showed, sometimes, you know, there are needs, if you will, for a blank wall. You know, in that particular case, there were change rooms for, uh, for a fitness center. Sometimes you've got a restaurant, uh, and not always is the kitchen at the back. Sometimes it's at the front or the side, you know, where you could have a corner building. Or there may be some kind of office uh, that needs, you know, no windows. You know, you run into those kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. The principle, good, right? Activity at grade, seeing surveillance, all those kind of things. That's all good. It's just, do we need to really prescribe a number like 70? Or can we let the building and its designers, you know, sort of evolve with staff and come up with a solution? That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Glenn, that's all the questions. Okay. Oh, thanks. No, there's one more. Councillor Fernandez. Thanks, Glenn. For, um, I'm just looking at the, um, the bonusing again, and m can you maybe help me understand from your perspective why you'd rather see it floor space ratio as opposed to square footage? Where's the benefit to your clients? So I, I've got it on page 4-1-45. It, it's not necessarily a benefit to my clients. It's just, as Dan said, it's, it's a question of, of sort of equity and fairness, if you will. It's the same. If you've got a small site, you're going to get, you know, whatever the number is, 400 square meters of X. It's the same if you've got a big site as a small site. A big site should probably get a bigger lift. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. And that's all the registered delegations, so there is a question of staff. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Fernandez. Um, yeah, so Mr. Curry mentioned um, something about um, the zoning bylaw being implemented um, when the OP, was, the, the application date between when the OP was approved and when the zoning bylaw was approved. My question is, if a site was, is under appeal and gets resolved, should that, um, the zoning bylaw implementation be backdated to the official plan uh, approval? Or should it fall under the new zoning bylaw? I'll give you a little bit of my opinion, and maybe this is maybe the question is a bit too challenging right now to ask to, to answer. Okay. But so um, um, allow staff to clarify a little bit. As I said, if it's a general question, it is a general um, question, and if staff feel comfortable, um, again, staff had indicated their um, you know the inability to go into specifics. Uh, especially on a specific property, again, they would have to go back, but if they can focus on the generality of the question, that would be good. So through the chair, I'm going to let Mr. Tansley uh, try to answer the question first. Larry? Well, let me try to throw this out. Um, official plans become effective on the date they become effective. They don't get, they're, they're not, they don't become retroactively effective to the date they're passed, they become effective when the date that the settlement occurs. Now, zoning bylaws are somewhat different. Um, when they become effective, they, they become effective retroactive to the date of passage. Now, what often happens is there's a section um, 24 of the um, Planning Act that says that despite the fact that your plan is, your official plan is under appeal, you can nevertheless pass a zoning bylaw that will then become effective when the official plan, uh, the underlying official plan becomes effective. So you've got those three things that kind of, if you think about all the permutations and combinations of those three principles, somewhere in there I th think would be the answer to your question. 
Good. Okay. All right. That's good. And again, those were all the registered dele delegations. Uh, we will now recess for the uh, first part of the meeting and then reconvene again at 7 p.m. And at the, the end of the meeting, then there will be the motion for staff. So for now, meeting uh, recessed. See you all back at 7.